financial system was on the verge of collapse. And we were running up a $1.4 trillion deficit, the largest deficit in the history of the United States. Now, my Republican friends say, we have got to go back to trickle down economics. We lost 400,000 private sector jobs. Obama's theory is a little bit different. And in the last eight years, we have gained 15 million private sector jobs, a little bit better. But while we have done much better in the last eight years than we did in the previous eight years economically, are we where we want to be? And the answer is absolutely not. What do we have to do? How many of you guys are working after school? Okay. How many of you are making wages less than 15 bucks an hour? That's why we're going to have to raise the minimum wage in this country to $15 an hour. You got Republicans out there who not only are refusing to raise the minimum wage, you know what they want to do? They want to abolish the concept of the minimum wage so that in high unemployment areas, people can make six, five dollars an hour. I happen to believe, and Secretary Clinton happens to believe, that if you work 40 hours a week in this country, you should not be living in poverty. That is not a radical idea. And there's another area where Secretary Clinton has been a leader on, and that is ending the injustice of women in America making 79 cents on the dollar compared to men. That makes sense to anybody? Well, it doesn't make sense to me, and it doesn't make sense to Secretary Clinton, and together we are going to fight for pay equity for women. Women deserve 100 cents on the dollar, not 79 cents. And Steve Framantino was up here, and I think he, he would tell you that real unemployment in this country is a lot higher than the official unemployment, because official unemployment doesn't include those people who have given up looking for work or working part-time. We need a federal jobs program to create millions of decent-paying jobs. And you know, one way to do it is to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. <clears throat> America used to lead the world in terms of the quality of our roads and our bridges and our water systems and our wastewater plants and our airports and our rail system. We no longer do because Republicans have been insistent that we not spend money. We don't invest in the infrastructure. But you know what happens when we put a trillion dollars to work rebuilding roads and water systems? I want to tell you a brief story. During the campaign, I was in Flint, Michigan. And what I saw in Flint, Michigan, nobody should have to see and no parent should have to deal with. And that is lead poisoning for their children. This is America. This is the wealthiest country in the history of the world. And yet children have been poisoned because of lead in the water, because of a crumbling infrastructure. That is why together, we are going to rebuild our infrastructure, and when we do that, we create millions of decent paying jobs. And when we talk about the economy, maybe the most important economic point that I want to make to you is the following. If we were a poor country, I would get over, I would have to come up before you and say, I'm a United States Senator, I have to tell you, we're a very poor country. I wish we could raise the minimum wage. We can. I wish we could rebuild the infrastructure. I wish we could make public colleges and universities tuition free. I wish we can guarantee health care to all people. I wish we could invest in transforming our energy system. We're a poor country. We just can't do those things. Are we a poor country? All right. We're the richest country in the history of the world. Listen to this. Since the year 2000, 
in the last 16 years, the number of billionaires in this country has increased by 10 times. In the year 2000, there were about 51 billionaires. Today, there are 540 billionaires worth $2.4 trillion. Do you all hear what I just said? We got the highest rate of childhood poverty of any major country. We got 47 million people living in poverty. We have young people leaving school, $50,000, $80,000 in debt. And yet, we have the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any major country on Earth. Top one-tenth of one percent today now owns as much wealth as the bottom 90 percent. You all hear that? One-tenth of one percent, 90 percent. Same amount of wealth. Does that make sense to anybody? And Donald Trump wants to give more tax breaks to the people on top and throw 20 million people off of health insurance by ending the Affordable Care Act. Hillary Clinton and I believe that the time is now to ask the wealthiest people and the largest corporations to start paying their fair share of taxes. I will tell you what, and I speak only for myself, what my great concern is for the future of this country, and I speak as a father of four and the grandfather of seven beautiful little kids. And that is this country, in many respects, is moving toward an oligarchic form of society. You all know what I mean by that? What do I mean by oligarchic? Who wants to help me out here? Yep. wants to add to that? Oligarchy. What's oligarchy? Yes. Stand up. Right. So you guys think you're living in a democracy and you got the right to vote, and that's pretty good. And in most cases you do, depending on what state you're living in. Some states are making it difficult for poor people or people of color to vote. But assuming you have the right to vote. You have the right to cast the vote. The Koch brothers have the right to spend several hundred million dollars determining who the next United States senators are and governors are and members of Congress all over this country. So you have an economy which is controlled by fewer and fewer billionaires, and now you have a political system in which billionaires are trying to buy local, state, and the federal government. That's called oligarchy, where you have a small number of people who have unbelievable power over the economic and political and media life of this country. And that is what I fear, and that is what we have got to prevent from happening. Now, how do you do that? They have the money, but we have the people. And our job is to bring people together, black and white and Latino and Asian American and Native American, gay people, straight people, people born in America, people not born in America. Our job is to bring people together and to think big, not small. Now, let me give you some examples of thinking big, not small. Donald Trump wants to throw 20 million people off of health insurance, which is what Republicans, most Republicans in Congress want to do. I am what's called the ranking member, the leader of the opposition on the Budget Committee, and they passed the budget, which ends the Affordable Care Act, throws 20 million people off of health insurance. And I said to my Republican colleagues, tell me, how many of those people will die? How many of those people will get much sicker than they otherwise should have to get? They have no answer throwing 20 million people off of health insurance. Secretary Clinton wants to expand health insurance. We work together to expand community health centers so that millions of people will be able to get health care and dental care and mental health counseling, a very important issue.
But we have got to go even beyond that. Question to you. How many major countries on Earth do not guarantee health care to all people as a right? Anyone know the answer to that? St stand up, tell me. Okay, that's a nice t-shirt you have on. All right. Who wants to elaborate on that? Is that true? Is this gentleman right? Could it be? Yes, sir. Stand up. Yeah. No. Nope. Yep. It's one. I live in Burlington, Vermont. Come and visit us sometime. And we're 50 miles away from Canada. Canada, they guarantee health care to all people is a right. Not a big deal. They've been doing it for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. What about the cost of prescription drugs? What country pays by far the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs? Anyone know the answer to that? You do, by far. One out of five people who goes to the doctor and gets a prescription can't afford to fill it. And you got a lot of old people who are cutting their medicine, their drug, their uh, pills in half. Hillary Clinton intends to do something about that and telling the pharmaceutical industry that their greed cannot continue. But what all of this comes down to is when we think big, it means that we are the wealthiest country on earth, that it is absurd that so few have so much and so many have so little that it is crazy that we have veterans sleeping out on the street who have put their lives on the line to defend us, and we have a million children in this country who are homeless, who go from place to place and school to school, in the wealthiest nation in the history of the world. And what we have got to do is tell the billionaire class, these people who have so much money, you would think that if you were worth $10 billion, you might kind of say, okay, that's pretty good, I don't need more. I don't need more tax breaks. I don't need to destroy Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid and Pell Grants. But that's what these guys want. They want it all. And what this campaign is really about is whether they get it all. And our job is to say, no, you cannot have it all. This country and our government belong to all of us, not just the 1% or not just the one-tenth of 1%. And that takes us right here to Akron, Ohio, because and I'm not sure this is a good system that we have, but it turns out that my state of Vermont is not considered a battleground state. Hillary Clinton is going to win Vermont. Ohio is considered a battleground state. And you have a significant number of electoral votes, which could well determine who becomes the next president and the future of your lives and your children's lives. Whether you leave school with enormous debt or not, whether working people have a living wage or not, whether we continue a campaign finance system that allows billionaires to buy elections or not, whether we boldly address the crisis of climate change or we make a bad situation even worse. Those are the stakes. And what I really want you to do is to speak to your friends. Your presence here tells me that you understand the importance of what goes on. But I want you to speak to your friends and ask them a simple question. If the Koch brothers, the second wealthiest family in America, a family that believes we should abolish Social Security, abolish Medicare, abolish federal aid to education, an extreme right-wing family, if they're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on this election, they think that this election is pretty important, don't they? They think it's important. Well, you tell your friends that if the Koch brothers think this election is important, they should understand that it is important and that the stakes are enormous. So I hope... I hope very much, not just that you will come out and vote for Secretary Clinton, vote for Ted Strickland,
And Ted's election is very important as well, because the United States Senate is up for grabs. One party will end up winning the Senate by one or two votes. It'll be 52, 48, 51, 49. And that election here in Ohio could be pivotal in that area as well. I hope that you will not only come out and vote and vote early or vote on election day. I hope you'll do more than that. I hope you will get involved in the process, register your friends. Too many young people are not registered to vote. I hope that you'll work with the local campus organization, knock on doors, get off campus, explain to working people and low-income people the importance of this election. And if we do that, and if we have a large voter turnout, Secretary Clinton and Ted Strickland will win here in Ohio, and the entire nation will be very gratified for what you do. Thank you all very much.